working. What have you done with my father? Here, see for yourself. <gasps> Your father is a little tied up right now. <laughs> Skeletor was just one of the many voices Alan Oppenheimer brought to life in his amazing career, a career that included performances on stage, television, film, and of course, behind the microphone. There's no question when many of us think of Skeletor, we think of his voice, and as we continue our Masters of the Universe tribute, it's a pleasure to welcome him to the show today. Hi Alan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. It's been wonderful being here. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, the quickest interview ever. Thank you very much. Isn't that nice? Okay. <laughs> That's the way you would handle a telemarketer. Oh, absolutely. Well, that might even be a few too many words for a telemarketer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about one of my favorite shows. Well, I appreciate you too. And let me just say, this was must-watch TV for me. And, you know, Masters of the Universe, the thing that, you know, we've talked about on this show already that's so fascinating by it, among other things, you know, usually it's the TV show that turns into the toy line, but this was the toy line that involved into an animated series that you were very involved in. You not only were Skeletor, but you did some of the other voices as well. I did. Uh, so how did you get the opportunity to uh, become part of the show? I auditioned. Um, my um, commercial agent, who was also uh, cartoons and all of that, and this is many years ago. This was in the 80s, 30 years ago, dear God. So I auditioned for it, and uh, I don't know how I came up with a voice. All of a sudden, I just went, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing, nas nasal, and put the laugh in. Yep. And then I got the part. Well, then after that went, then you're allowed to do, by union rules, you're allowed to do three voices for the price of one. Ah, okay. Oh, so that's how they uh, they said, can you do Merman? I said... Yeah, but, well, he's in water. So I said, well, okay, I want to talk like that. Oh, my gosh. And then they said, and man-at-arms. I said, well, yeah, man-at-arms is kind of straight, isn't he? He's kind of just no character to that. He's just kind of a hero. And so I did that. But then from time to time, I do it, I would do an incidental voice. So if I did four or five, then I would get paid for two voices, like two sessions. Okay. That's the way we, I think we did uh, something like, I don't know what, you probably would know, I thought it was left something like 124 episodes of this thing. So was this just something where, you know, was it just described as, you know, just gave you kind of a basic description, we're going to do this animated series about these, uh, about this guy who lives on Eternia, and there's these two swords and a villain, and yep. and we need voices? Kind of. They, they had drawn a cell of what he looked like. Mm, okay. So I, I did get to see that. It's very hard to put a voice to something if you don't have a visual. Sure. So, I mean, I'm, the same thing when I did Vanity Smurf. I saw the cell, and he was carrying a mirror, and he was self-involved, and that's how Vanity Smurf came about. It was very easy to to put a voice that's just, you know, oh, self-involved with himself. So it was the same thing with Skeletor. It's been the same thing with almost every character in cartoons that I've done. You see the cell the picture of what their concept is, and you fool around with it, and uh, a voice comes out. And it's usually, well, it's right for me. They buy it or they don't, but I've been very fortunate. An awful lot of them, they've said, okay, you've got it. Wow. That's fascinating to me, because, I mean, with Skeletor, you know, you basically got this skull in a mm -hmm. hood. And, yep. you know, I mean, it's literally just something that kind of triggers in your mind, and it, and it just comes out? Yes. It's all... It's very hard to explain. It's all really imagination and uh, uh, and jump right in. Um, it, I, I don't want to call it method acting. I'm not a method actor. But mm -hmm. I, I do believe in what is written, and I try to respect what the playwright has given us. And I find a character based on that. I try not to impose my idea, which could be very foreign and alien to what he has, he has written. I generally get the idea from what, what their concept is. But I have to say that when we started doing this, Skeletor was not a comic villain. But I, it is my wont, Scott, to always try to find comedy, even in pathos. That's good. I always do that. It's, uh, that's just the way I've lived my life, and that's the way I live my characters, too. So all, almost immediately, I put in comic insults. Well, they loved it, so then they began to write for me. Ah, okay. And that's, that's the way that works. Uh, I've done series like uh, Murphy Brown, and that was the same thing. I just came up with an attitude, and they loved it, so then they began to write for that attitude, you know? Those end up being the best type of characters to me. 
I think so. They're uh, yeah, they're organic, you know. That, that's why it works. Skeletor's organic. You'd be surprised the feed fan mail I keep getting. So it's playing all over the world. I got one from Macedonia last week. Really? Oh yeah. And I have to tell you, I've been to three or four, I think, autograph conventions, Comic Cons, mm-hmm. and one of them, three guys came up and quietly said to me how Skeletor and He-Man, Masters Universe, had changed their lives. They came from dysfunctional families, and they felt worthless. They were even contemplating suicide, believe it or not, at a mm-hmm. young age. And there was whatever the episode was that we were doing gave them the courage to, you know, throw away the hatchet and go on with their lives very successfully. But they they told me separately on three different occasions how Skeletor had saved their lives. Wow. Well, boy, if you don't think that's humbling. Oh, my gosh. You bet. Because all you do is it's an acting job to all of us. We do the job, and we get paid, and we say goodbye, and we'll see each other again. Yeah. You never think that that can have an effect on a young person's life, but it does. Yeah, and I'm sure that, you know, no thought in your head probably at the time that these characters would be so beloved to people in the show itself to where it still, you know, resonates and has meaning to them today. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, about three or four years ago, my sweetheart and I were taking a trip down South America, mm-hmm. and we were in a taxi in Santiago, Chile, and we had a, a guide in the cab with us who spoke English. A taxi driver didn't, he only spoke Spanish. And she said, but what do you do, Mr. Oppenheimer? I said, I'm an actor. So the cabbie said, what, what? And he said, actor. I said, oh. See. So he asks her what movies I've been in. And I named the movies, and she tried to translate them. Well, they're literally, they don't translate. In yeah. Different titles when you put them in the spaghetti. Right. He said, no, no, no. So then I said to him, do you ever watch cartoons? She said to him, do you watch cartoons? He said, yes. So I went, <laughs> he swerved almost off the road entirely <laughs> as he whipped his head around. Oh, my god! the same thing, believe it or not, with a different taxi driver and a different guide in Buenos Aires. The same reaction. Isn't that something? The Skeletor is international. <laughs> wow. And if you grew up with him. Uh, he made a, an impression on you as a kid, you bet. And now when I go to the Comic-Cons, people who are 40, 50 years old, they bring in their children or their grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And they say, we watch it at home, the reruns, and we have the DVDs. And They wanted to meet the, the real-life Skeletor. Well, <laughs> gee, I don't have a skull head. Well, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's very nice. It's very nice. Yeah, Skeletor is not a self-portrait. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> well, I mean, you you still got the laugh, and it's it's great to hear that. And I recently saw a YouTube video where a fan approached you and asked you to do the voice, and I thought it was great that you can still flip that switch and do that voice today. Can you give us a little line here as Skeletor? Well, yes, I can, Scott. I don't quite understand what you're doing in Texas. If you'd have half a brain, you'd be out here in California where it's warm. And no tornadoes or storms or floods. Just earthquake. <laughs> that is so great. You talk about it uh, being international. I mean, you do that and the visual of Skeletor literally appears in my head. That's right. And that's what I think. I mean, thank you. That's a, I take that as a, as a great tribute because that's what it is. That's exactly right. I see it when I'm doing it. I really do. I, I, I really see the characters I'm doing. I don't care whether it's this or Vanity Smurf or Transformers. I do. I, I see the character. It's. Uh, I said. That's why I said I'm not method, but I don't know what method I am. I guess it's my method. It works. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the one that works. That's the important thing. Yes, sir. Well, you know, you you mentioned Murphy Brown a second ago because your career has uh, included being on screen as an actor and, of course, behind the microphone as a voice actor. Did you tend to like one over the other? No, I didn't. Uh, Most of my early work and even later is stage. I I started out on the stage for Mm -hmm. years and um, did repertory theater in Washington, D.C. at the arena stage and did musicals in Beverly, Massachusetts, in the musical tent there. And then uh, I was three years uh, on Broadway with Sunset Boulevard, playing Cecil B. DeMille with Glenn Close and Betty Buckley. Very nice. Yeah. I've done every bit of this business except the circus, and I kid you not. (laughs) I've done everything else. Radio, television, cartoons, commercials, motion pictures, stage. I think the only thing I haven't done is a circus. 
So are we still looking to do the circus? No. No? <laughs> Not even the ringmaster? <laughs> you could do the ringmaster really, really well. You just have to stand there and throw that voice of yours out there. You don't you have know, to fight the bears. you got to be about six foot two and have a lot of hair. No. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and I look really silly in a toupee, so I never wear it. I wore it at a couple of shows, and I, I turned them off when I saw them. I said, so I said, never, never. Not doing that again, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the reason I came out here, I was doing Gypsy in musical stock with Margaret Whiting. Mm-hmm. She was playing Mama and I was playing Herbie. And she said, you know, you really, you really ought to go out to California. They're dying to get 30-year-old bald character men out there. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. So I came out here two or three years later. So oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. They're always looking for someone. Well, somebody was with, with a different look than yeah, you know right. your, sure. your, your good-looking leading man. There's enough of those around. Yeah, there character is. Character men. Character men have always interested me. I turn in Turner Classic Movies almost every day and watch these old guys, and I just love those character people. I yeah. just thought they were wonderful. I do, too. We talked about some of the uh, characters that you've been on Masters, and um, you mentioned a couple of the other uh, cartoons you've been involved with. You were also involved in one of my favorite characters, an animated version of Colonel Troutman from the Rambo series. Oh, Rambo. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You're the first person who's ever brought that one up. Oh, really? <laughs> I can believe it. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Oh, my God. I forgot about that one. Colonel Troutman was one of my favorite characters from the films. So, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Was that David Jansen? It was um, Richard Crenna. Richard, I always got Jansen and Crenna mixed up anyway. Yes, that's right. One of the voices that uh, people approach you a lot about, and rightfully so, is Falcor in The uh, NeverEnding Story. That's oh, a beautiful picture. I love that character. I loved Falcor. I loved the movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, in November, I think it was this past November, uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music was uh, doing a screening of that, and they asked me if I would come from here and do an introduction and a Q&A afterwards, and I did, and I loved doing it, and the audience was wonderful, and there were the people there who'd seen uh, Never Ending Stories six or seven times. Wow. It's wonderful. I think it's a great movie. Talk about two very distinct, uh, oh, yeah. different voices between Skeletor and Falcor. <laughs> See, they'd already filmed that. Yeah. And they had to put a voice to it, so mm-hmm. I auditioned for uh, Wolfgang Peterson here, and he, again, he showed me what the character looked like, so I knew, you know, it was warm and fuzzy kind of thing. I gave him the voice, and he cast me, and I went to Munich to record it at the studio there. And we, we did it all the first day, and, and then I said, okay, can I hear a playback? And he said, sure. And he played it back, and I said, I, I don't like this, Wolfgang. Uh, it's technically all right, but uh, let me have another crack at it. I, I can do this better. Mm-hmm. He said, well, no, okay. So grudgingly, I came back the next day and recorded it with um, with heart, not just technically. And he said, I said, that's good. That's the one he used, of course. Ah, uh, so it was the second take. The second take had the, the character had heart, which is what you see now. With yeah. Help, you know, it just, not just it's difficult enough to ADR to, to lip sync to what they've already drawn. And that's what I was doing the first day. But I realized I was very technical, but, but Falcor didn't have any character or heart, and that's why I wanted a second day, a second run at it. Yeah, and it's a great it's a great voice. And, you know, you've still been able to do some voice acting in, in recent years, including some voice work for video games, and I would think, having worked in film and animation, that it's got to amaze you that the level of realism and storytelling that now exists in video games. It is, and then, of course, you're doing each scene with three or four different lines so that the... Uh, the uh, player can choose the route that he wants to take, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that is that is straight radio acting. That's what that is. That's really straight radio acting. I, I remember seeing something just here recently where they were showing Ataris and Commodore 64s and, and how we all thought this was as good as it gets. <laughs> and you look at what they can make now. It's so... Oh. It's just oh. unbelievable what they're capable of now, so all, that and animation in general. Oh, yeah. Well, I can say this. I mean, uh, I mean, your work on, on many things is true of this, but you know, since we're focused on uh, Masters of the Universe, I can tell you I still love the fact that they've come out with DVDs and ways for us to watch these shows again and enjoy your work on them again. So. And your kids watch it now, too. And those are the people who, who bring their... Uh, they're 10-year-old or 9-year-old kids to these Comic-Cons to beat yeah. us all. Yeah. You know, I can say this. My brother 
and his wife just had a, um, their first child in December, and my brother and I have already made it clear that she's going to grow up with uh, all the cool things that we got, and I'm sure that's going to include Masters. That's great. Well, do you have uh, anything out there now or coming up or that you're working on here on the horizon that you'd like to tell everyone about? No, not really. I'm I'm really largely retired now, Scott, and uh, I, I I travel and I uh, do my sports, and uh, I, I don't want to do plays anymore. Don't want to learn those lines anymore. <laughs> and uh, I've had a very long career. I started when I was 17 years old, and I'm 83 now. And I stopped doing this about it when I was about 80 or 82. I said that's enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, why do anything else when it's so much fun to just throw that voice out whenever you want and have cabbies drive off the road? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, it's been wonderful. It's been a marvelous, marvelous long career. Well, it's tremendous, and it's and it's a real honor and a pleasure to talk to you, not only about Masters of the Universe, but so many of the other great things you've done. And so I really appreciate you coming on the show today and being part of this. Well, that's very nice, and I appreciate it, too. Good luck to you. <laughs>